really uh, exciting moment for me and I think for uh, all the team of the project uh, that we are uh, we are coming to the end of this project, which is uh, co-funded by the European Union with the Creative Europe program. Uh, the project is uh, managed by the Georgian Museum Association and uh, uh, NEMO, the Network of European Museum Organizations and the Academy of Cultural Management. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the partners for their great involvement for making this project as great. Uh, and of course, we had some uh, delays, some uh, problems during our implementation, but uh, I want to say that we are uh, really uh, emotional and we are really excited that we could create the good platform for all the uh, countries uh, which we covered during this project. So the project has two main components. The first one, it was international training program, which was delivered during these three years for all the three countries. The South Caucasus region, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And I'm really proud to say that within this international program, we had uh, more than 250 people benefited from this uh, program. And uh, we could create a good platform which will continue, which will continue the life after the official closure of this uh, program. And another great component was that uh, the participants of this project and beneficiaries, they worked on uh, several issues, uh, several researching issues in these three countries and we will have all the deliverables and all the results of this project later available uh, on our website. I cannot uh, move um, uh, with my speech without uh, remembering uh, the head uh, and the leader of this project, Inga, uh, um, without her, um, this project could not be realized. For me personally, it is very emotional and, and I'm sure that many persons are connected with good memories uh, to Inga. Thank you very much for her remembrance. I would like to thank uh, uh, the uh, the people who uh, joined me uh, with this welcoming session. I am giving the uh, word to Nino Samuelite, who is representative uh, of the European Union delegation in Georgia. Still thinking about uh, Inga, I was uh, still remembering the opening of this uh, launching of this project in the ministry. And uh, I'm sorry, my thoughts were there. So, Lana, thank you very much. And um, I want to greet uh, our uh, partners, uh, uh, also guests uh, today attending and participating in this meeting. And uh, once again, I want to congratulate you, congratulate Georgian Museums Association uh, and highlight once again importance of this project, especially uh, on the background of the developments in the sector. And, and I think uh, we always mention this project, we, we highlight this project because uh, Georgia is uh, the, the lead country is the project so it's also it, it's been always uh, like an exemplary uh, for us uh, when we talk about creative europe and the potential um, beneficiaries and applicants in this program and uh, on this note i want to highlight once again that uh, we've been supporting development of uh, creative industries in georgia for years uh, both uh, on bilateral and uh, regional level and uh, we've been also supporting uh, modernization and development of museum, museums, uh, considering our previous projects, very successful projects with Georgian National Museums uh, and other partners. Uh, as you know, we had uh, now a twinning project with Georgian Museum, which was very successful. And we were always proud of the, of the results achieved throughout this uh, project. And of course, the people uh, who have contributed a lot uh, in this process. Uh, and uh, when we talk about this uh, very specific project, uh, I want to uh, highlight once again that this, uh, as I read the results achieved uh, under this project, I think the project strongly supported the broadening the knowledge in museum field and also strengthened its role uh, in the society, not only as it functioned as a museum, but as an actor to, to advocate, uh, uh, to advocate certain 
um, uh, initiatives, policies on national level. And it's really impressive that like 200, around 250 uh, practitioners benefited from this project. And what is very impressive is also this uh, collaborative approach of uh, up to more than 400 museums from Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia uh, bringing uh, inputs in this project and of course uh, the participation and uh, uh, engagement of uh, of nine countries overall in in the project so this is indeed something that we are trying to support under creative europe to strengthen links cooperation and networks between eastern partnership region georgia and the european countries and on this note, I want to once again highlight the importance of the Creative Europe program, which I think is one of the, I would say, um, the main channels to support uh, our cultural actors in this country, support artists uh, uh, to team up with the partners on international level. And I'm, I'm very happy that Georgian signed uh, the, the contract to continue the second phase of the Creative Europe in last December, 2021. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if we have representative from Creative Europe Georgia desk here, but uh, yes, I want have. to uh, very good. I want to once again uh, highlight their role and thank them once again to uh, have so many applicants and so many successful applicants from Georgia. So my compliments to to Creative Europe Georgia uh, Europe Georgia desk as well. And uh, um, uh, and then uh, I also want to highlight that, especially uh, when we are talking about Georgia's further approximation with the European Union, uh, I think uh, it is essential to highlight the role of culture and related cooperation projects, especially when it comes to people-to-people uh, uh, -people contacts and social interactions, because in the end, the approximation process is not only about signing the, the agreements, the questionnaires, but it is about daily communication and people-to-people -people contacts. And I think culture bears a huge role in this direction. And um, in the end also want to uh, highlight that we are very happy to see like some very concrete results achieved under the project. And we strongly hope that the Georgian government will uh, will continue its efforts to make creative industries more popular which bears uh, also a huge potential role for the countries and uh, for its economy and uh, uh, we should look at culture not only as a, as, as a source of art uh, creativity but also uh, a source which can generate job creation and economic growth uh, uh, growth in each country so once again, I want to congratulate you. I want to um, thank all, all participants uh, involved in this uh, process. Uh, and uh, I want to wish you also success in your upcoming uh, activities. And I hope that the partnerships and the links that you have established here under this project will be, uh, will be uh, bringing more cooperation projects for you in, in, in the future. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Nina. Thank you. Uh, now I want to ask Katie Shengelia, uh, who is the head of the uh, Great Europe Desk Georgia. And I want to underline that uh, when we started this project, Katie's involvement and Katie's support, actually the desk support was really crucial. So I was just uh, Maybe almost 24 hours uh, on the phone with Kathy, where, and actually this um, feeling the application of the European Union, it was also a challenge for me and uh, uh, I have learned so many lessons from this application as well. So I want to thank Kathy uh, once again for her support and ask her uh, to say a few words. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here and want to welcome all the, all the participants and the partners. Uh, I remember when we learned that uh, the project was support selected by the European Union Creative Europe and I remember the joy that we all felt. It was an incredible feeling because uh, B Museum was one of the first projects led by Georgian organization supported by Creative Europe and it was an incredible feeling. It was perhaps like a proof that we showed the Georgian government that it's worth participating and paying the participation fee to be part of Creative Europe back then. We keep on still using this as a success story, as an example to prove to our government and all the other governments that are planning to join the program 
that it is possible, even though it is hard and challenging, but it is still very much possible. Uh, I'm glad that Georgia signed an agreement with the EU to continue being part of Creative Europe. It's very important. And I just want to really underline that Creative Europe is a unique program that fully supports culture creative in all individual sectors. Uh, other than this, I mean, European Union realizes that this money is an investment. It's not just support of culture. It's investing in people who work and represent the field of culture, which is very important. Um, this project, Be Museum, or, I mean, the results are incredible. So many people have benefited. And it's uh, very interesting that it showcases the region itself, not only Georgia, but Armenia and Azerbaijan as well. So these countries are also benefiting. And this sparkled the interest in participating countries as well. Armenia, since has joined the Creative Europe program and is planning to join the next phase as well. Azerbaijan has expressed an interest to become part of the program. So this all comes from the successful projects and partnering with them. And it's very, very important. I want to also underline uh, the support of uh, our ministry. Back then, we did implement a match funding mechanism, which was a good practice. And I believe that all the examples that uh, we did and we supported these beneficiaries, we have to and we will try to use this as an example to get the match funding again for our potential beneficiaries. Um, I want to as well also remember Inga because I remember her role and her participation here. And I'm very sure that everyone who knew her misses her very much. Um, so once again, thank you. Thank you for making this happen. Thank you for your work because you've been through a lot. Everything that could have happened, happened. <laughs> the pandemic, the war, everything. So, I mean, it's an example of a project that managed to adapt and adopt, you know, all the digital shifts. So it's very much is an exemplary project that I'm sure will continue and will continue to be sustainable. And hopefully you will try to apply again for Creative Europe. I know the bureaucracy is tough, but I think at the end of the day, it's worth it because you get to, you know, cooperate internationally and, see that the struggles that we're going through here locally, people are going through them as well in different countries. So that's very important. I mean, the cooperation between, between the minds alike are very, is very, very important. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yes, the results uh, when the project beneficiaries have started collaborating and networking and even though they started the collaborative project, it is just really exciting result for us. So we will try to continue and make this project alive after the, um, when we officially close the project. Thank you very much. So now I want to ask Alejandro Ramilo, a project coordinator from the European Union. Thank you very much Alejandro for joining us and please. Yes, uh, hi, uh, Lana. Uh, I would like just to, to um, would like just to recall a few things on why we consider that uh, this uh, project was important for us. In the sense that, uh, so we are the uh, the agency in charge of the management of, of the program. So we were the ones actually that answered the call, evaluated, isolated, selected this proposal. So there are a few things that I would like just to, to highlight is that uh, for us, it's very important to have coordinators, you know, that are as good as the, um, the Georgian Museums Association that are coming from what we could say uh, underrepresented countries, no? Because um, despite the fact that uh, um, Creative Europe is a very inclusive program, uh, we have a little bit of a bar, I mean, a barrier, which is what we, what we call the uh, success rate which means that there is a huge demand uh, for these funds. So basically to make it through uh, is uh, it's, um, it's a token of uh, the uh, added value and the quality of, uh, of a proposal. And this actually, uh, in this case, I'm really very happy that you, that you actually made it through. The, uh, the, the success rate is estimated more or less around 20, 25%. It actually means that maximum only one project out of four actually made it through. So uh, we do realize that uh, the application process is a little bit uh, overcoming. 
And uh, I can just to share with you that uh, the entire system has been streamlined and simplified. So you will find it a little bit, even if you have to use a new corporate tool, you will see that from the project point of view, it's a little bit easier than it was in the past. So that's a little bit good news. So I would like just to encourage uh, to have um, uh, more applications from uh, from Georgian coordinators, which for us, I think is, is really very important. Um, and then secondly, uh, the um, uh, another aspect that was very strong in your proposal and for which you were really, it was really very well appreciated was the regional dimension. We uh, we have a lot of uh, attention, you know, I mean, concentrated on for historical reasons in the Western Balkans region. So we have a lot of projects already that they are, uh, so I'm talking of, of another region, no? I mean, you know, that for which we have a, a, an important number of uh, proposals that actually are involving partners from the area. This is not yet the case uh, for uh, the uh, Caucasus uh, region. And this is why we believe that uh, it was worth supporting this project. It actually was really very good uh, in involving uh, partners from the other two countries, even though not all of you were uh, Creative Euro partner countries at the time. So, uh, but you made it happen. And this is, I think, uh, one, of the, one of the good points uh, of your proposals. As you will see, um, the participation of known uh, countries is a little bit more um, easy under the current uh, program, but um, I hope that uh, both uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan will actually join the family, which will actually would facilitate uh, equal partnership uh, applications, you know, from organizations from these three countries. Obviously, this cooperation should not stop at the Caucasus region, and you are obviously feel free to, 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 to reach out to more. Which actually leads us to my last point, which is that uh, not only you put uh, forward a very good application, and I'm actually looking forward to uh, hearing more about the success of the project, but you also involve one of our the best networks that we support. So in this case, uh, we also were very happy to see that the network of European museums organizations, which we have been supporting already since 2014 with the Creative Europe program phase one, let's say. And, um, and we would like you to consider expanding, you know I mean, from the region that I actually was calling for, which is the Caucasus region, and NEMO is actually a, a very good platform to facilitate this cooperation beyond, uh, I mean, with European Union countries, with other members, you know, that uh, from other countries. And, um, and I, I, I think that I hope that this project actually uh, managed to create a kind of a network of uh, individuals that will actually last over time. So if I only have one thing to ask you for is just to this one, is continue uh, with this uh, amazing work and uh, please make it last because sometimes uh, our investments in the cultural sector are short lived or project bound. Meaning that at the end of it, you know, I mean things kind of disappear or tend to be transformed into something else. So please build on the success of this project and please continue developing, you know, the, uh, the amazing work that we have been uh, undertaking until now. So that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Thank you for your uh, support during the project and thank you very much for joining and for these words. We will try our best. Thank you. Now, uh, on, uh, on the last point of our uh, welcoming session, I again would like to thank personally to uh, Julia Pagel, Marjolin de Boer, uh, Bjorn Steinmers and Lilia and uh, all the staff from NEMO and from the Academy for making this project just very sustainable and great. Thank you very much. And I will give the word to Marjolin to open the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, it's an honor to make the transfer to from collection to connection. And of course, I would like to introduce Alessandra to you. But since Alessandra wants to make connections too, I suggest that we all put in the chat. I'll make, do it as an example. The country that we're from, 
for me it's the Netherlands. The city we're in, mine is Nieuwegein, which is a typical Dutch pronunciation. And then how do we feel? A one is lousy, couldn't be worse. And a 10 is perfect. So I'm feeling like a seven. It's pouring rain here, but okay. Could you all do that within 30 seconds so that we can see where we are? Björn, wow. Some people are very happy. Networking, going forward, a lot of struggle, striving towards a new world, but still working in the old one. Challenges, networking, gates to new futures. More overview on the collections and to use them in different ways. Wow. People still are writing their comments on your on the theme of our conference. I'm very happy to introduce you. Uh, Alessandra Gariboldi is a researcher and advisor on audience development. And if I would say it in one or two sentences, um, she is convinced that culture should be used to improve people, people's lives, right? And you work in an institution, you'll tell us all about it, that is that its main goal is sharing all the knowledge that you had through your research. So you couldn't be more welcome for your keynote, Alessandra. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mary Lynn. Um, first of all, I have to say before the presentation that I'm really happy to be here. I would really have put 10 instead of nine if I didn't have those technical troubles. Um, first of all, because it, for, for my whole life, I wanted to visit Georgia. So I've got a feeling that now I'm kind of in, into it. Now, and second, because when um, Julia and Marilyn invited me, I was thinking that it's a great, great opportunity uh, to exchange with you because uh, I have been working for 20 and, well, 20 and some years now in the cultural sector in Europe, basically in Italy. My foundation is based in Italy, in Turin. Um, but I never had the chance, for example, working all across Europe to work with the Caucasus countries. So that area for me is something that really I'm so curious about. So one of my concerns at the beginning was, I don't want to get into the process as if I were kind of a, you know, uh, someone coming from another world. <laughs> uh, and uh, so please, uh, I will give you my presentation, which is a let's say my perspective, our perspective, which is Italian and basically Western European, or let's say until the Balkans. And um, because it's a vision that has been shaped really over time, thanks basically to support of the European Commission. So all the things that I will tell you, you can put it on uh, Marjolein, you can go further to the next slide is basically the results of cultural cooperation. So the same process you went through uh, with the museum. And, and that's, I, I think it's extremely important because um, coming from Italy, uh, we always have the perception that we are somehow compared to the countries in the north of Europe, for example, we are always the last ones because we entered late into management, we entered quite late into marketing, we entered late into uh, other things that were seemed easier in other parts of Europe. And this, uh, let's say, process of going through European cultural cooperation really dismantled every and each bias that we had and helped us understand, gaining a completely different understanding of which were the real challenges we were all facing, uh, really regardless where we were coming from. Not uh, ignoring that cultural context have a huge importance. So please, whatever I will say, I would like to hear you, from you after, uh, how do you see it from your perspective? If you think that it, it makes sense also for you, because it's not mandatory, okay? It's not evident, um, possibly not. And if it's not, it's even better to, it's even more enriching to know, because it will open up different perspectives on these topics. 
So basically what we what I will be talking about for 15, maybe 20 minutes, I hope I won't be too long. So please, Mario Lane, just sign and tell me, no, <laughs> it's too late. Um, is uh, what we learned through these projects. The first one was the Adeste project. It was a lifelong learning program. It was still a Leonardo da Vinci program. And uh, basically we wanted to, let's say, um, train, so create a professional profile that could, let's say, equip a cultural professionals with the means to plan audience development. Because we started from the observation, which is an evidence, that there are plenty of amazing projects done by museums, theater, especially museums, and especially educators all across Europe that are that have always been working with people, for people, creating amazing experiences somehow. Uh, but these were project-based, as we have been hearing also by your officers. So a huge problem in change making is being project-based. So the sustainability of change is one of the major issues when you try innovation processes. And, um, and basically, uh, we tried then this project through other European funded projects by Creative Europe. So, this spectacular and this spectacular that were with Fitzcarraldo works with all sectors. Um, we basically research and do capacity building and, and, uh, and a lot of transnational cooperation. Then in 2015, what happened is that and after each project, we had a lot of learning. Uh, basically, in 2015, when the tender for, uh, from the DG culture of the European Commission asked to create, let's say, a kind of repository to in investigate how good audience development look like, because that's the issue. We all know that we want a lot of people, very diverse people, happier people and uh, in love with us, <laughs> basically. But uh, first of all, we don't ask ourselves why. And second, we don't ask ourselves what should we change in order to do so. And this uh, research had as a subtitle by request of the European Commission that already knew, let's say, the digital already knew in 2015 that this was the key point, was how to place audiences at the center of cultural organizations. So not, not in the usual process of production of a museum, so you've got your curation, you put on your exhibit, then you pass all the content to your educators and marketers and communicators and tell them, mediate this content, sell me this content, find the right people, bring them, bring them here and sell tickets. Okay, so that's the process. While we knew that this wasn't enough. So it has to be into the organizational thinking of organizations. Uh, then we tried out through an Erasmus different processes of introducing some change management tools like uh, in design thinking or so. And then in the last Adeste Plus project, actually we realized that we tried to model and we actually did it, um, a, a process to help cultural organizations, all kinds of cultural organizations, including museums, some museum were partnered, with us in Adesta Plus to create a blueprint, so a model of intervention, basically a series of workshops with a series of tools to help organizations and museums in this case to shift their perspective, uh, relate to their audience in different ways, and especially doing all together. So not just educators, marketers, communicators, but as an organization with their own collective intelligence. So this is what we basically, you can go on, Marilyn. Uh, um. So basically, uh, for us, since the beginning, it was about developing audiences, okay? But with a clear understanding that developing audiences meant to change something in ourselves. So it was about innovating cultural organizations and the way they relate to people. The next one, please. So how museums shifted their perspective on audiences over time. Uh, just to tell you that it's not that we didn't try in the last 20 years. We tried it hard in many ways. So please, next one. So one of the ways we did it usually was ignoring audiences. So they were not part of the museum. 
they maybe were there, but we didn't know anything about them. And we basically didn't look into their needs and their capacity, what could be interesting to them. So they were simply not existing. But if we go uh, to the next one, please. Uh, there was another way. So for those who were interested, uh, basically it was about numbers. Okay, so many, many people queuing to get into the museum. That, that this was the dream of directors. So having a lot of people selling a lot of tickets and adding them. Uh, uh, but still totally indistinct, okay? Just people getting in with, and no one actually cared about what did they get from that experience within the museum. It was just, you know, adding people in. Next one, please. Uh, then we had a kind of a shift, especially in the 90s, where it appeared, end of 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, uh, that basically audiences were uh, customers. Mm -hmm. So marketing uh, developed a lot and thankfully because it, it brought with itself the idea of a, a, a culture of data. So the relevant importance of data, knowing your audience, trying to segment them, trying to provide them with a, a meaningful experience that wasn't just about having a good collection but also creating the uh, customer journey so that they felt in a nice way. So it was it, definitely an evolution, but still they were, let's say, consumers. Okay, this next one. Then we had a kind of a shift. Hmm? And the, the shift was about uh, thinking about people and audiences as someone who could relate to our collections and even, let's say, play with them. Hmm? Even having something to say, or at least we understood the importance of, that, of having engaged audiences. I'm not saying that this is the pathway that one thing comes necessarily after the other. They were kind of dominant paradigms in different stages, but also they survive still now. So there are some directors, and then of course we, we don't do names, but who really don't care about having people because they mainly talk to their colleagues. And this is quite evident in the way they do, for example, write their captions sometimes, for example. So this is what happened, please go. And even if we improved a lot, what happened is that with the next please, uh, actually cultural participation patterns didn't change. So for about 20 years, museums, theaters, and libraries and all were really improving a lot in the way they were kind of communicating, marketing, their own proposal, cultural proposal, adapting to citizens somehow, refining their tools, but still it didn't change. It didn't change in, and really it didn't change not so much a lot, but in some cases it lowered it. In Italy, we have really low cultural participation rates, very low, impressive ones. If you think about the amount of heritage we have, but still this is the reality. So basically, this is true over time, and it's also true, next please, if you think about the difference in, among European countries. So in these statistics of 2015, so of course they are old, but uh, uh, Eurostat is not very up to date, let's say, but still measuring cultural participation is quite our challenge, uh, let's say in a comparable way among countries, but still the issue is that we didn't do it, we didn't do enough, let's say. Next please. So we learn to use data to analyze your, our audience, to, to plan our activities, thinking about audience planning, so having an intentionality. We also learn how to design more engagement in our offer somehow, but all this was not enough. And next, please. This is basically because probably we, were, we had something wrong in our assumptions. Uh, especially since 2014, since the European um, G-Culture, so the Creative Europe program, put into its priority audience development. Finally, we had a lot much of effort. So you see how policies really change, and European policies in particular really change the way people work, opening up new directions. Nothing of this would have been possible without the European Commission. This is just to, to say that that's definitely true. Um, so please. Uh, the issue is that we can be as much sophisticated as we can, okay, so with incredible engaging digital 
uh, and whatever uh, sophisticated tool, but cultural participation and audience development is the way in which cultural institutions contribute to the major challenge of increasing cultural participation. It's not just the way they become more sustainable in their own context. It's also the way they contribute to a major challenge. This is definitely a cultural challenge and not just a technical one. It's not enough to learn tools. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mario Lenin. So the issue is that audience development can, and in my opinion, in our opinion, our many partners should be the process through which cultural organizations uh, aim at changing their relationship mm, with their present and potential audiences, with citizens. But if a relationship is a true one, a very honest one, no one of the two parties keeps being the same. So it's not just about keeping be what we are, being what we are, and finding ways to bring in people, but also how can we change in order to become more relevant? So how we are changed by these experiences? As every educators will tell you, because the educators know that this happens in a constructivist approach, this is what happens when you interact with someone. It's like communication. You can't get as you were before. Please go ahead. So, Where's the problem? There are two kinds of problems. The first one is in the way cultural organizations work. So next one, please. Basically, what we do is working in silos. And this is not just a cultural problem or a problem of museums. This is a problem of every kind of organization. So breaking silos will be a buzzword that you will be hearing about a lot in the next years, because this is already a buzzword, as it was audience development, by the way, because it's an idea that seems to like everybody, even for, let's say, sometimes the wrong reasons, just to, because they want to have more people in the tool. Um, the point is that we are, as professionals, in one sector, in one area. If I am an educator, an art historian, or a marketer, or a curator, or whatever, I will be seeing things on my own perspective, from my own perspective. I don't have the language, the understanding that other people have from its perspective. We, we, we aim at the same, so we all want to give culture to people, provide people with amazing cultural experiences, but we see it in different ways. We have different ways of thinking and we act separately. So basically we produce, we mediate, we sell, and we say bye-bye. That's the way we do it. Next is. Now, the issue is that even if you are a very good organization in which all these functions are well, very well coordinated, so in a way you function very well, your exhibition production area or conservation works perfectly as such, but it's not enough if, next slide please, all these people is working towards the same direction at the same moment with the same intentionality, which is that you need different perspective because people is different and different it has to be the perspective inside the organization, and with an intentional, let's say, direction, which is we all want to reach people, that kind of people, not a generic idea of people, because people doesn't exist. There are individuals, okay? So to whom we are working for, with, and why, all together. And how can we do all this together? This is what we tried to do with the Adesta Plus project, creating groups coming from all different departments and making them work together creatively to put their uh, perspectives together and see, create new possibilities of work with and for audiences. Please go ahead. So the second problem and last one is a political problem. And it's in our assumptions. We, so we can go ahead, please, Marjorie. Um, in cultural policies, and we all are immersed in cultural policy paradigms, whether we like it or not. Cultural participation as such is an issue and it has always been an issue. So since the fifties, we are talking at European level and global level about cultural access and cultural dem and, uh, um, democratization of culture, because it's absolutely evident that public funded culture is paid by all taxpayers, all kinds of citizens, even the poorest and the less educated ones, but still culture is enjoyed and practiced and experienced mostly by people who are the most privileged ones. So richest, more educated, 
in our society, for example, the whitest. So, and basically the profile of people attending culture is always the same. It didn't change since the 60s, which is the first time in which a sociologist, Bourdieu, analyzed them that uh, profile, let's say, theorizing that we have a cultural capital and cultural capital is also a form of exclusion. So cultural policies are this kind, the kind of choices that governments, but also institutions do, deciding what is relevant and what is not when we talk about, in, in the case of culture, culture. What's the value of culture? I mean, a cultural policy instead of another one, and this is quite context related, for example, in Italy, we, are, we have always been based on the excellence paradigm and the cultural identity and heritage, because of course it has a huge uh, importance in this country, not only in this country, but I can tell you, for example, for us, valuing contemporary production is much more difficult. And you see it when you put money into something instead of something else, because the policy is that, basically deciding where limited resources go. So uh, please go on. Um, cultural policies, in a way, reflect the, the, the patterns of national cultural fields, and they reflect their structures. They reflect the way we think, what we value when we think about culture. And there are two basic paradigms. Please go on. In cultural participation, in uh, let's say, in cultural policies relating to cultural participations, and these are the two basic paradigms always there often unseen, untold, unaware, but they are there. They are the basis on which all uh, choices are taken by governments, local governments, funders, and so on. What do they, we, oh, everybody says we love culture, and everybody says we love people, and that's okay, and everybody says we love democracy. Of course, okay, that's easy, but how? Hmm? So the two paradigms just say, the one of the democratization of culture, just say, as interpret culture as in participation in terms of access. So everybody should be able to enjoy and have access to the best possible culture, which is of course very nice, very true. But as such, this is the interpretation. Usually policies in this area do you know, work on pricing. So for example, free entrances, uh, free activities or whatever. But basically, or if they are in, in a more, let's say, uh, proactive approach, they try to do outreach for underserved communities or underrepresented audiences or more vulnerable ones. But still, let's say, is that idea that you have to give them something mm -hmm. so that everybody can have. The cultural democracy paradigm, on the other hand, stresses the totally opposite thing. In the cultural democracy paradigm, there is no culture with the capital letter C. There are cultures, cultural expressions, and culture is relevant because it has to empower citizens as active players. So give them stage. Basically, is more, let's say, radical in its democratic understanding of what culture is for. Uh, of course, there are in, in the middle of, and there are also, let's say, countries where these two paradigms are coexisting. Eh? But when we think about audience development and cultural participation as an institution, as a museum, we should know why do we value culture. And so if for us, also as an institution, not just as a political environment, which is beyond your possibilities, a single institution, um, is what's your position. So please, next one. So asking ourselves what power relations are at play in cultural and educational institutions and practices is really important. So we must be, uh, we must be aware that whatever we propose as cultural institutions with our relevance and with our importance, because people believe in what we offer them, because we are museums, We've got a huge responsibility in what we propose, the kind of stories we tell, the way we tell those stories, and the possibility we give to people to have their say on those stories that we are telling them. Please. So that's the, the point that uh, designing and managing uh, this encounter between people and culture through our institutions 
implies that we ask ourselves, at least ask ourselves, I'm not saying that you have to have an answer to that, but at least question yourself and talk about it internally with your colleagues. What, why are you telling this story? For whom are you telling it? Who are you representing through those stories? For example, in Western Europe, these typically dealing with our post-colonial uh, inheritance, we have to do a lot of work on that, for example, in the way we represent ourselves and we represent others, just like if they were not human beings, but anyway. Um, so which portion of reality are we showing and asking ourselves if what we want is to challenge reality, improve reality, making democracy more relevant or more true somehow, we also have to somehow asking ourselves if in the way what we do things, we are not reinforcing biases, stereotypes, and uh, if we want to be, for example, the place of encounter for cultures, for different cultures, for example. And of course, these also imply, and we can go to the next uh, slide, to ask ourselves how can we, uh, if and to what extent are we uh, interested in giving up some of our power in defining what is culture or in interpreting our collections. Because if audiences can be and were actually first a mystery, then numbers, then customers, then engaged visitors, they can also be citizens and potential contributors. They can have their voice to feel, to be empowered, let's say, by this, by this process. Next, please. And this can be done in many, many ways. I mean, many nice ways, not dangerous at all, because I know it's also a matter of uh, knowing your institution, knowing if, is it something that can be applied to your context? Because maybe not, it's not for all. But, and so you have to realize and to think about to what extent you want to give up that, open up that conversation. And in this museum, for example, they were just asking people in the rearrangement of and redisplaying of a collection, what did they think about it? So there are questions around those uh, artworks, for example, to use and inspire, be inspired by those questions, normal questions by normal people on how to do things. Next one, please. We are almost done. Uh, or also you can ask people to reinterpret uh, personally linking their own biography to artworks. This was an amazing project we were involved 10 years ago in Brera. Please go ahead. So more in an autobiographic. Or they can reinterpret heritage and history. This was uh, a bombing on a, a steel fab, um, industry of the Second World War, of which no one ever talked because it was made by our Americans, <laughs> not by Germans who were the bad ones. So, and because we didn't have to show uh, it wasn't the right moment to talk about it. So to elaborate that memory, you can work with people, let's say, and create new shared interpretation, healing also um, these uh, experiences which can be traumatic. So treating past not as uh, something to celebrate necessarily, but also something to interpret. Please go ahead. So this is the last slide, and uh, I found it very interesting in, in a book that I read some years ago about historical museums. And, uh, and this historian and director was just saying this, so no one can be an expert on any subject. So I'm not saying that everybody's an expert. There are experts and there are people. So I'm an art historian, I'm an archaeologist, I've got that knowledge. It's not that you can say whatever you want on, on archaeology, but we can have a conversation on that. And we can allow people and making them feel as if they were able <laughs> to do it because they are, they should be. And if they are not, it's our responsibility somehow. So that's the, the end of the presentation. I'm sorry if it was too long. Sorry, Marilyn. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I thought I was talking already, but sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you for, um, for, for really making us questioning ourselves whether we do enough. I, I heard you say it wasn't enough for at least five times. 
and um, you, you really uh, challenge us to ask these questions. Do we do enough? Do we really use our responsibility the way we should? Do we allow more perspectives? Um, and it reminded me also of yesterday when we had a digital study visit to Germany where a uh, very small museum told us about the volunteers who were really experts on some subjects. So they engaged a lot of volunteers and learned a lot from them as well. There's not a lot of time for questions, but still, if there are some, I would like to know. Thanks, Alessandra, first of all, for this uh, super presentation, I think you know, setting the, the perspective and the, the bigger um, scene uh, always is super important for any kind of conversation to go. I wish, because what you were presenting is, uh, is a bit of an ideal <laughs> approach to um, what museums and other cultural institutions should do. In your experience now with the real world, how many percent of the museums, and let's say from Italy, um, are, oh. <laughs> are doing that regularly? Because when you're saying, putting it into a perspective, that means that you have to renew this perspective according to a changing society and challenges coming ahead uh, quite regularly. So how many museums do you think have uh, taken this approach or are trying to do that regularly? Zero dot something. <laughs> okay. No, that's true. I mean, that's the, that's the issue. I mean, we are institutions. All institutions are smaller or bigger. They are reluctant to change. We have now a chance, a chance I have to say, because after COVID, everybody knows that things can't come back as usual. So in a way, this is a huge but still, in reality, these are very little practices that try to make the revolution within. So that's the way innovation happens, if not super facilitated by policies. Because it's not, we are all, let's say, all cultural institutions and museum in particular with huge costs of maintenance just to keep safe their collections. They don't have to invest. Usually they are understaffed, underfinanced, and this is, this is true everywhere. So basically in most of, of Europe for sure. And uh, or run by volunteers or mostly run by volunteers and with just one person paid, for example. So this is the normal and, and not just in the Caucasus. I mean, that's normal everywhere. So in this sense, that's not the, this is where we would like to go. This is what we see that when it's done that way, it works. You gain relevance, you gain more sustainability within your communities. And when you will be attacked, you will also be loved and defended by your communities because you mean something to someone. Wow, to be loved and defended. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Isn't it what we all want? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but it's not easy. No, right. Anna Lolo, I I don't know whether I pronounce your name, but please put on your, you raised your hand. You want to ask a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Frau Gariboldi, um, for your speech. Um, I found it interesting and inspiring. You talked about this power dy dynamics, uh, which exists between cultural institutions and uh, consumers of this culture about museums and um, I do agree with a lot of points. I was just wondering um, what you think about um, objects, collections themselves, which are themselves very powerful. They, they have this enormous authority invested in them and they're old and they have their own materiality. They're not touchable. Um, you cannot really engage with them. And um, how do you really see museums democratize themselves when they have these huge, powerful collections. What is the perspective there? Because it's, I think that it's on, not only about this, this kind of strategies, which would give them new meanings and engage people by just um, reinventing them with stories, 
but it's also about these objects that exist there and that produce knowledge um, and they that have enormous power with them. How to how to democratize these collections? What do you think? I think that we should start a little, but yes, that's true that the unbalance of power is structural. So it's part of the physiology of the museum itself. But there is nothing you can't uh, discuss. I mean, even the biggest things. And all, not all objects, I mean, in the, with the thousands of objects within a museum, you have to pick the ones that allow that kind of conversations, let's say. Given that there is some complexity that it's not, we could, I think we will never be able to, we say, rebalance. We are not community art centers, we are museums. So we basically collect objects. Uh, we curate the way they are, let's say, preserved and displayed and communicated. So this is probably something that can't be solved, but it's a tension you should have. And, um, also, for example, if I were in a context away from theory, because the issue is that if you look into the, from the theoretical point of view, there's no solution. If you look at from the concrete point of view, from the practical point of view, you pick an object and you understand, and you have to let's say, curate in this aspect and discuss if this object can be actually interpreted in many different ways, or not just because it can't, but maybe it's too sensitive. Maybe it's something that won't kill anyone, will just put contrast on the, on the table, will just uh, create conflict, and this is not what you want. Unless you want to create conflict, because also this idea that we are all pacified communities, this is not true at all, conflict exists. So it, it also has to be raised if you're able to manage it. But in theory, if I, if, if I stay on the theoretical side, your question is perfect as the one that can't have any solution, because this imbalance of power is there. There are people who know and collect objects and people who don't. <laughs> uh, on the practical side, I think that this can be arranged according to real uh, context. I don't know if I answered Anna, actually. Alessandra, I really would like to have a lot more questions and I s see that Anna asked people to put them in the chat because we have to move on. How interesting it is. I, we also want to hear the real Sorry, world. I, I, have, I have one question, actually very important question. I skipped introduction, but I would uh, like to ask a question about uh, situation, uh, which is contem contemporary situation nowadays. We survived COVID as we all know, but uh, what, what you could comment on situation on Ukraine situation, because we are now all speak about a very idealistic situation in Europe with museums, but we know that we have neighbors and especially in Baltics and Ukraine situation and in, in Georgia as well. So, how we can predict our future and our nice future with museum field if we know that we have such situation in our nearest neighborhood? Alessandra, the last question. The last question is, of course, a question without any answer because we can't predict any future. <laughs> that it's a too difficult question. Um, I, I'm I'm not able to answer that. I think that what we can do. I mean, we first have to acknowledge we are museums. We are not. We don't have superpowers. That's for sure. And there are biggest issues, but still, museums as they uh, became, for example, uh, for vaccination hubs. Uh, hosting doctors in their areas or uh, being used as places for refugees or so they can also act culturally somehow with, as, alongside with all the rest of society but they can also act culturally in making meaning so function as place of encounter this is the only thing I see but of course what you are saying is definitely true and too big to be tackled by museums as such. But of course, like in all other situations, museums should partner in cross-sectorally with all the rest of the world. So social structures, health structure, educational structures, 
to become part of that. So we are part of the answer. We are part of civil society answers. Trying to put what you have special in your. Um, we are now, for example, in Italy, we have some in, in our uh, Ukrainian refugees. Also, I don't know, they are trying to provide them with uh, also healing by just having a good experience because they come from the terrible. So also having enjoyment in museums just for that. And it's not, and you say what it is, it, it's, it's what we can do. <laughs> we do what we can. I think that uh, it's a very, very hard question and I would like to, to have a better one, but that's the one I have. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. And being, trying to be part of the answer is, thank, uh, is I think, the, the lesson. Try to be part of the answer, yeah, and do what you can. Yeah. So the real world is calling. A small museum in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, trying to be part of the answer as well. Stein, I will introduce you very shortly since we're a bit short of time, but Stein works at the Verhalenhuis Belvedere in Rotterdam, which is House of Stories. And um, I'm a big fan of them. Uh, and I think Stein will show you why. Thank you. I'll start by sharing my screen. Um, and I want to take you to, to Rotterdam. Um, if I look out of my window now, I see the, the, the river, uh, the river, the Maas, um, and uh, it's a beautiful river. There's a beautiful view from the building. That's why it's been called Belvedere. Uh, I see the river, uh, and just as in many cities, a river does just like a train track, a highway, or um, whatever else the city can cross. Um, it's, it causes a division between the two sides of the city. In the case of Rotterdam, it's the north, south, north side and the south side. Um, and um, until recently, when you got a, a touristic map of Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam would end with the river. Uh, down the river, uh, nothing happens. Uh, and that's where we are right now, uh, on the south side of the river. Um, and we, the Vala started with a project showing uh, what did happen on that south side of the river. Um, by showing the people that lived there. Uh, the South Side had a re very bad reputation um, in Rotterdam, but in the Netherlands as a whole. Uh, it's the only uh, neighborhood in the whole Netherlands that has a, that has a national program. Um, uh, and there was all press, all, everything, publicity was, was bad, really bad. Um, so what the initiators of this exhibition wanted to show is the people that made the neighborhood uh, and what they did. So they, uh, they started a, a collection of groups uh, within that neighborhood, uh, groups of people that uh, were important to each other, but important to the neighborhood as well. Uh, so that's, for example, the, uh, the mosque uh, nearby. Uh, that's a, a Baruch, uh, a metal uh, and hard rock uh, venue uh, fully run by volunteers. Um, the Surinamese Singing Birds Club coming together in the park, showing off their, uh, their birds, their canaries, uh, joining exhibitions as well. Um, but also uh, the courthouse nearby. So these were all groups that... Hi. So that's the <laughs> exhibition I was talking about. It was an outdoor exhibition with big photos, uh, big group portraits. And if you go to the next one, um, it's the, the mosque. Um, the next one is uh, the uh, metal stage, a venue nearby in a former bunker. Uh, next one is the Surinamese, Surinamese uh, Singing Birds Club. Uh, and then the last one is the, uh, the big courthouse. So they were all very different groups from the South that normally wouldn't maybe meet each other, um, but uh, went all on their own individual photos and came together in that exhibition. So until that exhibition, nobody had seen their own photo. Uh, so when they arrived at the exhibition, it was the first time uh, seeing their photo. And of course, what you do is 
first of all, you go to your own picture. Um, but then once you've spotted yourself, uh, uh, seen that you look good or not, uh, you start to look at all those other pictures. So all of a sudden, um, the, the, the people from courts met the people from uh, the metal venue, while they normally maybe wouldn't meet. Same with the people from the mosque and the uh, Surinamese, Surinamese singing birds club. Uh, so an all new network opens, new connections, um, and a way to bring people together. During that exhibition, during the build-up, uh, the people that initiated it, they needed a place to work. If you go to the next slides, uh, you'll see uh, the place that became. Uh, so this is a picture from the early uh, uh, 1900s of the building we are in right now, or I am in right now. <laughs> um, uh, and you also see uh, on the left, there's already the words Belvedere on it. It was built as a Grand Café, you see in the next slide, um, with apartments upstairs. And it has a very rich history. Um, so the people that started here, they squatted the, the building. It was completely empty on the inside. Uh, there was nothing happening. Uh, the glass was broken. There was a brick that was thrown to the window on the floor. Uh, they cleaned it up and they started to use it as a workspace. And while they were working there, people from the neighborhoods started walking in and they started telling the stories from uh, the building and these neighborhoods. If you go to the next slide. Uh, so for example, this neighborhood we are in, uh, it's Katendrecht. Um, and for centuries, it's been a place of coming and going. Rotterdam is a big harbor city, um, which really influenced the city. So for example, the picture you see here is the first uh, Chinatown uh, uh, of Europe and the first Chinese restaurant of the Netherlands, Junko Glo. Uh, and the man on the, on the right, on the far right, um, his son uh, is still coming to uh, the Vahalais every day to drink a beer. And he's a big source of all of the stories we tell. Uh, but on the next slide, you also see uh, something closer to this building, uh, which is a Surinamese uh, jazz band during the war. Uh, during the war, uh, Second World War, um, uh, jazz was forbidden. Uh, und Arte de Kunst. Uh, it was American music, it was black music. Um, but Katendrecht had a special position um, uh, within the, uh, the German territories in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, uh, jazz music, music was possible here. Uh, on the next slide, uh, you see it was also has been a Greek nightclub. And this was just before, uh, just after it was being closed. Uh, so you see all these migration groups coming together on Katendrecht, which is the, uh, the Chinese community, the Greek community, Jewish community, um, Cape Verdean community, a lot of communities still um, living in Rotterdam, all have their roots on the islands or, uh, of Katendrecht. The next, how do you collect those stories? You record them. Uh, so we do that in different ways. This one actually is our mobile uh, recording studio. Uh, it's on wheels, uh, so we can uh, put it behind a car and drive it around the city and place it whatever, whatever, wherever we want. So people don't have to specifically come to us, but we go, go to the places where the people we want to speak meet um, at their own, um, uh, with their own restrictions or um, uh, at their own specific time, at their own specific place. Uh, and then if you see the next slide, there are a few examples of interviews. So the first one was with a woman who survived World War, uh, Second World War, who told about the bombardment of the city. After that, there was an Indonesian group. And this woman was, uh, we interviewed on just before her 100th uh, birthday. Uh, and she had a big, uh, important, influential um, gallery on Curaçao within an exhibition about. The next slide, uh, you see, the, so we record those stories and uh, we share those stories with headphones on uh, in what we call uh, Luistervoorstellingen, uh, so listening performances. It's like listening to a podcast, but then live with a group of people. 
uh, and the most special thing about it is that you're fully closed off with your headphone on, uh, but once the headphones come off, uh, the story starts. So every story always leads to a new story. Uh, so that's one of those ways uh, in which we share the stories we collect, but we do that in many different ways. So if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see our kitchen. We have a big kitchen uh, with a big cafe restaurant, and we work with guest cooks, uh, all Rotterdammers, all from Rotterdam, but with different migration backgrounds. Uh, so this is a, a group of Chinese women uh, living here in the neighborhood, uh, and they cook a meal. And when you come eat with us, you don't just get your meal, but you get the story from the cook with it. In the next slide, we have a few examples of that. Um, these are uh, Ethiopian cooks, and the next one uh, is during one of those days. So we have long tables, uh, you share the food together, uh, you sit with strangers at the table, um, and always, again, the story of the cook inspires others uh, to tell their own stories. And then the next slide, uh, and we have different floors, and I'm now going to get talk to you about our exhibitions uh, that we do, uh, which is another way to share our stories. Uh, so on the top floor uh, is the former residency of um, the Rotterdam artist couple, uh, Wally Edenbaas on the right, and uh, his wife, Esther Hartog on the left. Um, they came to Katendrecht during the war. Uh, she was a Jewish uh, photographer. Um, and during the war, she went into hiding in this building. And the special thing about it was that the complete neighborhood knew about this Jewish woman in hiding, but nobody betrayed them. Uh, and at night, there would be a knocking on the door uh, and there would be a hot plate of potatoes. Uh, so also after the war, they stayed in the neighborhood out of loyalty for the neighborhood and really um, um, demonstrated the God against the demolition in the 70s uh, or helped their neighbors with whatever they wanted. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, you see uh, their work, uh, lithographies, photography, and in the next slide, uh, another picture of their home. Um, and we turned their home into a house museum, uh, opened up their house, um, but we really like it to be more of a house than a museum. Uh, so we try to get as much life in it as possible uh, by inviting people uh, to have residencies there. Um, to get uh, new art being made there. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, for example, we now have an artist um, uh, with a Greek background and she's doing an artistic research into um, how she is inspired by her Greek heritage, but also the artists that live there uh, travel to Greece a lot, um, also used Greece as an inspiration, but from a complete different perspective from his uh, a Dutch perspective and a very romanticized uh, image of Greek, of course. Uh, next slide is another example of her work. And then if you continue, you come to another artist we work a lot with, which is Dolph Henkes. And Dolph Henkes was uh, world famous on Katendrecht. Um, uh, he lived here for all his life. And uh, a special thing about this is that he always lived here, but also used Katendrecht as his biggest inspiration. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see I'm actually sitting in front of a painting of his. Uh, so it's the, the one on the left bottom. Uh, it's a painting of Chom Kok Lo, uh, the first Chinese restaurant I told you about. Uh, but a lot of the stories we tell, a lot of the stories we collect, we can illustrate with that work. Uh, works that are all part of the collection of the Dutch state. Uh, because the artist donated it to his, uh, after his death to the Dutch state. Um, but as I said, he's kind of forgotten. Uh, so all his works are collected in the big depot of the Dutch state, but they almost never leave the depot um, until we came uh, and saw something in that work uh, and tried to find a new relevance for it. Um, so I have a collection of different works from different periods. So on the uh, top left, there's a picture. Yeah. I think that they each need to understand. Yeah, yeah. So there's paintings from Curaçao, Jewish, Rotterdam, uh, the jazz artist and the war. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you can see, uh, and again the next, uh, you can see one of the exhibitions we did, uh, which was about uh, the war. 
which started with Dolph Henkes portraying the, the war in Rotterdam, the bombardment here. Um, but the painting on the left is by an artist from uh, Syria, Mozab uh, Asghan. Um, and we combined those stories, giving that story of the artist from uh, Rotterdam a new relevance with uh, uh, the contemporary stories from now. Uh, if you continue two slides, I think, uh, and one more. That's another example of Curaçao. Uh, so we had uh, Dolph Henkes, who has lived in Curaçao for several years, um, painted there a lot, uh, but paintings made by a white man on Curaçao um, what do they still tell about that island 75 years later? Uh, so we invited uh, Curaçao guest curators um, who were born there, moved to Rotterdam, who made the, the cross that's the other way that Dolph Henkes did, um, uh, to tell what do these paintings mean to you? What do they tell about the Curaçao you know? So that's how we work uh, a lot with guest curators, people that participate in already the earliest stage of the exhibition making um, to tell that story together, not we telling that story, but um, uh, tell them but with the people that, uh, that we're talking about um, and to give that, that artwork, the, those artworks a new relevance, but also lift up, uh, kind of lift up those uh, family stories, uh, migration stories um, by giving them uh, uh, making them museum-like. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's that's the, uh, that's what we do, and that's how we continue to work. So Dolph Henkes, we are now working on our 15th exhibition. That's, I think, the last slide, the next one. Uh, one more. Yeah, so that's the exhibition I'm working on right now. Uh, after his death, Dolph Henkes uh, left his studio uh, to the Dutch state, and all of a sudden, out of every drawer uh, in every box, they found uh, uh, pictures of male nudes uh, that he never talked about, never showed. Um, and on Katendecht, nobody knew about his uh, homosexuality, uh, while uh, he had a lot of male collectors who did know, uh, who did buy those drawings, but they were never shown publicly. Uh, they were already traded under the table. Um, so we're now making an exhibition about uh, safe spaces. In, in Rotterdam, starting with the studio of Dolph Henkes as a safe space for himself. Um, but then uh, with interviews with uh, a young uh, LGBTQI plus community in Rotterdam, talking about what their safe spaces are um, and how they look back at uh, coming out or the, the taboo around it. Uh, so that will be the 15th exhibition. And the beautiful thing is that with stories you're never done, uh, and every story always leads to a new one. Uh, and that's what we always try to anticipate on. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Stein. Thank you very much for uh, expressing how one story always leads to another and how your museum can be a safe space. Wonderful. I suggest that we wait with the questions till the next two best practices because we are a bit short of time and I think it's also interesting that I don't want to interrupt too much. I would like to present another best practice, uh, Anna Trapaidze. Uh, she will present uh, the best practice from Georgia. Uh, she is environmentalist. Uh, she is uh, founder of the Museum of Environment, Digomi Meadows. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, well, I am a physicist by training. And just recently, I turned into environmental activist. And uh, it's been two years with the pandemics I became, I became an environmental activist. Can you see my screen? Sorry. Yes, and yes. please make it in a full screen mode, yes. please. Um, well, while pan during the pandemics, so I stayed, I stayed at home and uh, well, I was I was giving lectures from my home when I noticed strange noises and a strange motion of um, uh, trucks. So I got really interested what was happening and find out that the area I moved recently was actually under, under big um, 
big um, criminal uh, impact and I had to do something. So I first became an environmental activist and then later on um, I also founded a museum of environmental environment in the Golden Meadows and I'll be sharing my story by first telling what is uh, the Gomi Meadows and how it can be a museum. All right, uh, so I said that this uh, museum came later after I already was uh, um, into activism. And uh, so um, it started as a project and it got financed by the German corporation and Red Caucasus through the project called Greenovation. So it is an educational project. So we are not registered or we are not, I'm not even an NGO. I still represent a civic um, activist group. And so basically what we do, it's, uh, it's um, yeah, um, how to say, well, we are, we are out of register. Just a volunteering what we are doing. So the Gomi Meadows is located in the north of Tbilisi. Uh, very close to the very densely packed, uh, densely populated districts, but uh, until recently it was kept intact. And um, so basically it is the only remaining riparian forest in Tbilisi because it was intact and it has its distinguished flora and fauna, beautiful place to see, but not many people knew about it. Well, in, this is an image of 2013, that it how, how it looked um, I don't know, nine years ago. And this is a map of, uh, of last year's summer in 2021. You see clear changes. So the buildings here you see uh, on the screen, <laughs> I don't know if you see my cursor, uh, that's where I live. And so uh, I witnessed how the par large part of the forest just disappeared out of 70 hectares of forest, only 15 hectares of forest are uh, remaining. Well, how it happened? Uh, apparently, during these pandemics, uh, when we were all locked down, some, um, some, some criminals, <laughs> they had a green light to do their illegal activities. And so they um, started excavating sand and gravel, uh, storing, the, uh, storing the mineral, processing it, and then filling the uh, uh, landfills with the construction, sorry, the, the mine pits with the construction waste. So that's how it looks like the area. So you see the uh, the pit holes after the illegal gra gravel mining, uh, and this happened like basically in four months. Yeah, starting from I don't know from February till May June, <laughs> very huge area. Like I don't know, fifteen hectares of the area was excavated, and um, quarter million of cubic meters of sand was taken out. And it was stored in a huge piles directly on top of the forest. And you see the the, uh, the forest covered in a construction waste. So some sometimes they used construction waste in order to fill up the um, mining pits, or they just used the construction waste to dump directly on the on the forest. Why? I don't know. Maybe it could could be that. Uh, so they first wanted to use the, all the resources with the area had and then say that, okay, there is no forest. Why you should have a recreational zone status? Let's uh, make a new construction site. That could be. Well, so I had to fight all this criminal to investigate whether it was a criminal in the first place. And then I had to stop it somehow. And I had to tell it to, to the people what was going on. So nobody back then knew about this new district called Digomi Meadows. Uh, actually, it's called in Georgian Divim Stralebi, and Digomi Meadows was coined by us. So we started ground activism, legal, legal uh, acts, actions, um, act, very active media, media coverage. But the main thing was we had to, we had to make people love us to protect us. So we had to make Digomi Meadows know, uh, known to other people. And in one of the conversations we were telling to the, to the city hall, um, representative telling them, you have to save the area, you have to restore it. Uh, because it's a wonderful recreation zone. That's the only remaining riparian forest. It has fantastic flora and fauna. <laughs> Very important. Um, well, please restore it. But if you don't restore it, what do we have? We have just a pile of garbage and disaster, horror. 
horror, disaster. And he said, okay, it can be turned into a museum of horror or a museum of environmental crimes. So many people will come here and see what the shameful things you allowed. And he said, okay, bingo, that's an idea. So if life gives us lemons, and if life gives us garbage and environmental um, disaster, we have to do something. Well, we have to solve it, but if we can solve it, at least it has to become a lesson. Uh, so that's what where we said, okay, we have to make a lesson out of this terrible story. We have to inform people and tell them uh, what is in general and what are in general environmental crimes and uh, what happens in the Gomi Meadows. So uh, we started our project last year in June. That's when the renovation challenge was held and we won it. So we got some money in order to uh, get some equipment for our, uh, for our museum. And so what we are doing now. So, um, so we looked around and we said, well, we have this beautiful nature and uh, very polluted area. And what we will do, we'll be bringing students mainly school students to show them whatever they are reading in their books about environmental uh, crimes, about uh, pollution, they can see flesh and blood in reality in the Gomi Meadows. And they can also see what a riparian forest looks like and how nature is trying to heal itself, what the humans are doing. We said that that could be a very good, uh, good lesson. So we, we, uh, we, we started with uh, eco-tours and eco-tours mean that we are just making tour around the area. So we make a, we go around the area and show, we go into the um, mining site, we go to the uh, construction waste site, we go to, to, to the lakes, riparian lakes, which are still remaining there. Um, and um, yeah, it, these tours were just a general tours, just going around and seeing what is going on, what is going on there. But um, later on, also the schools really got interested to to come and do excursions with us and do green classes with us. So we had many children, many classes coming to us of different ages. I don't know, from the first grade till the all until the until um, their fi final year, they're coming to see the Gomi Meadows and they all found it very interesting because uh, we were talking not only about uh, environmental crimes, but also how to, how to be an activist, um, how, to change, how to change our behavior, what can be done, what, how can we solve the problems. Also, uh, this is a great opportunity just to observe the nature which is uh, there, which is healing. So these are the few photos of from our uh, our events, which is pretty adventurous for kids as well. And as I said, in this area, it's like an island in the city. Uh, still, uh, still there is a wilderness, but it is so close to the very densely populated district, and people can come with a public transportation. Um, so um, for that, we don't only offer excursions, but we also offer green classes. So for example, on the left, we are seeing the class where we had um, um, taught environmental rights. On the right hand, we, we have a class of uh, you know, painting and, and the, um, in the um, lake, on the shore of the lake. Um, so we also do the observation, lots of bird watching sessions are held there or, or just we're observing how the seeds are spreading. Some, so oh, everything can be done, starting from uh, basic uh, nature or science, I don't know, we go deep into the biology, um, um, <laughs> um, ge geology. So we can really offer classes um, tailored for the needs of different uh, group ages or different subjects. So we also organize larger workshops. Uh, so we built uh, houses for stray animals. We fed the um, birds by making the uh, feeders for them. Um, we, we, made, we had a workshop of um, uh, ecological um, toys. Uh, well, we are hosting lots of workshops uh, together with the educational um, project. Um, 
And of course, this area is public area, and we want to say that. Uh, well, uh, I I say that I represent a museum, but uh, well, it doesn't really exist, as I said. So nobody really owns the area; it's owned by everybody. It is, it is municipality owned area. So we want to encourage people to come here and enjoy, whether it's a recreational, um, you know, recreational side of it or educational or just to make an exhibition. So we organized several events and the last event, which we organized in the, on last uh, last Sunday was environmental fair. We don't, in Georgia, we don't have actually, uh, we didn't have any uh, environmental fair, fairs um, before. So this was uh, one of our first- uh, Sorry, we have two minutes more. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, and I'll go into statistics. So being, uh, in, uh, so in one year, we managed to um, reach and bring 30 plus schools on site. We had more than 1000 visitors, especially in the pandemic times, it was very important that everything was closed down uh, closed and uh, our site was open. So we had the visitors from age of two till, um, till <laughs> they can come to our place. And well, um, I can I can say that um, with our efforts, we may really managed to change. Uh, first of all, to show what is the Gomi Meadows, to show what environmental crimes look like, and make these people more conscious um, about their actions. And yeah, we try to encourage them to take actions on their own. So if they see some environmental crimes, to to step up and. Um, uh, become an active uh, citizen. So I think with overall, uh, we are happy with our was one year long and it is ending now, but for sure our museum will, will continue in next year and yeah, we'll hope many to host many more events and many more excursions and clean classes. Yeah, if you would like to contact with us, so here are my, are my details, and I'm open for questions later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for this presentation. We wish you good luck with your uh, project and then continuation. So we will have the question uh, session after all three best practices are uh, presented. So now I will go to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Shirin Melikova, who is a chairperson of the ICOM Azerbaijan, our um, great partner. And uh, Shirin is a director of the Azerbaijan Carpet Museum. So um, due to the time limit, without further ado, I will give the floor to Shirin and she will speak about the audience development and accessibility in Azerbaijan museums. Thank you Shirin and the floor is yours. All participants uh, greetings from Baku. Thank you very much for invitation and uh, thank you very much for this great uh, project really we hope that it will continue. Uh, I would like to share with you with uh, best practices in uh, our museums in Azerbaijan. Uh, and I would like to start uh, with Azerbaijan National Carpet Museum, which is the first of its kind, uh, which placed in a unique building and um, uh, which uh, really uh, a very uh, universe museum because we not only collect uh, and uh, um, show our best collection, but at the same time, we make a lot of projects to uh, make our audience uh, different and to make our museum uh, really reachable uh, for uh, all people. Uh, so I would like to tell you about our uh, very interesting project, uh, a museum without border. Um, and uh, we started it uh, from um, nine, uh, 2019. And uh, first, uh, uh, because of the building itself, it's really reachable for people uh, with different disabilities, visitors in wheelchair easily can, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, can uh, see our collection in all uh, three floors. Uh, and uh, to read, to touch touch screens and so on, to, to read all uh, captions and uh, explications. Uh, so, and we um, together 
with the Museum's Traditional Technologies Department uh, uh, created uh, special carpets, as you see on my presentation. This is a, um, a special uh, carpet, uh, which uh, combine two techniques, uh, pile and flat techniques. Uh, and uh, so um, it, it uh, makes a chance to people, uh, visually disabled people, to touch these carpets and to and, and understand the, and feel uh, different uh, uh, ornaments and, uh, of course, uh, their meanings. And uh, I would like to tell that um, this uh, our uh, program is really very uh, successful. Uh, we uh, uh, were working on this uh, together with uh, uh, Azerbaijan's visually impaired society. So together we identified optimal uh, weaving uh, parameters of uh, the future products, uh, uh, the height of pile and uh, their de uh, density. Uh, and we in intensively uh, sought information and advice uh, and come to the idea uh, to make the carpet an inclusive artifact. And uh, the specialty of um, uh, our museum means uh, that both vision and touch uh, give people a generally complete impression of uh, carpet art. And if you do not allow people, included sighted uh, people, to touch the carpet and uh, look at its uh, reverse uh, side, it is impossible to explain the differences in flat weaving techniques, for example, understand the carpet structure and feel its material. And uh, um, the small carpet samples designed and uh, prepared uh, by the museum weavers and artists accompany uh, our permanent exposition and uh, uh, such an interactive and tactile uh, uh, display is necessary uh, for a detailed understanding of our collections uh, specifies and it's, uh, in, it engages visitors of all ages. And uh, significantly, uh, significantly uh, this innovation makes it possible for individuals who are visually impaired to see our carpets. Uh, and that's why we really, um, uh, they, they have a chance to come to our museum and find out information about uh, 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 the collection uh, and, um, and the different periods of carpet weaving card. So uh, the several museums uh, that preserve textile objects have already reached us and delivered their interest in our practice. And I'm happy to see that these collaborations increase into new projects, advancing our main goal, Museums Without Border. Uh, our museum um, uh, also uh, work with, um, um, we, we have a children department in our museum and we constantly organize different uh, uh, kind of um, uh, lectures and um, um, uh, organize master classes, trainings, uh, focused on our permanent collection, revive forgotten, uh, forgotten weaving techniques and teach these techniques to uh, visitors uh, of different age groups. And for small children, uh, we created a, a puppet theater. Uh, I, I would like to say that all what you see now on my uh, slide done by uh, our staff, uh, started from the puppets, uh, from decorations, and even the playwright also. Uh, th this was a, a flying carpet uh, premiere of uh, um, our new um, uh, performance uh, for children. And uh, it is very interesting. It, it's a narrative about uh, a journey of uh, 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 the small boy, uh, Omar. He travels all, all over Azerbaijan and meet different carpets and their meanings and he learn about car a carpet weaving cart and then he can uh, see all the collection all different carpets in our museum so this is like a really very interesting show and one of the also our um, uh, 
um, a way to increase our audience. I would like to tell um, about uh, uh, other museums. Uh, Azerbaijan National uh, Museum of Art, it's uh, one of the biggest museums in Azerbaijan, and uh, uh, which uh, um, uh, the, the, the total collection more than 15,000 uh, 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 artworks and uh, uh, the museum is uh, uh, very famous but by its uh, um, uh, collections and, and the uh, uh, activities, organize uh, different exhibitions uh, and uh, lectures, excursions, programs for families, children and yours. And this uh, year on the uh, 18th of May, uh, they organized a very uh, interesting uh, and uh, rich program um, uh, with a uh, um, uh, concert and uh, uh, interesting uh, um, visual art uh, program. So this installation, what you can see now, uh, it's a um, uh, digital uh, digitalization of their art uh, collection uh, and uh, a new way of presentation of it, uh, uh, which is really very interesting. And the other project uh, done by uh, artist Farhat Farzalif. Uh, so as you can see, it's a uh, ballads that were brought, uh, transferred by, by the artist into tools uh, for creating artwork. Uh, uh, ballads, which uh, later become a musical instrument uh, for writing this uh, requir requiem dedicated to all the dead and uh, wounded. Uh, contemporary uh, art space and they have organized also a different kind of uh, project. Uh, for example, they have a, a Yarat art school an alternative contemporary art school for artists, curators, art managers, art critics, art, art researchers. Yarat Academy, a project for, for the audience who wants to dive into the world of contemporary art, uh, local and international artists, curators, art historians and critics. Uh, share their practice and knowledge with public through talks, lectures, discussions and workshops. Uh, Little Yarat, an education program for younger audience from school age children to teenagers. Uh, Yarat Freestyle Project, it's an open uh, platform for everyone, individuals, actors, dancers, performers, uh, artists, and so on. Uh, Yarat Talks, a platform to discuss collections and ongoing uh, exhibitions and different uh, other uh, activities. Uh, and uh, very interesting um, also activities by State Museum of Musical Culture. Uh, so uh, the um, uh, the working towards audience development, the museum created the Museum Lovers Club accessible for everyone from fans to professionals. The club gathers uh, in a pre-arranged space every first Wednesday of a month uh, to enjoy good music, a nice talk and relaxing atmosphere. The meeting includes concerts, a meeting with musicians and music films, and also very good um, 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 best practice of this museum. They have an ensemble of a traditional instruments, and all these traditional instruments revived by a museum, and now this, they perform uh, uh, all the uh, traditional and uh, 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 different uh, periods of traditional folk music. Uh, and they take part in different kinds of events, uh, not only organized by a museum itself, but uh, even uh, in the uh, uh, in different countries too. So a very, very good practice. And the History Museum, also one of the oldest museums in Azerbaijan, which uh, um, uh, situated in the great uh, building of 19th century. So uh, they also make a, a lot of different kind of uh, activities. And uh, for children, for young uh, people, this is one of the best, uh, Archeo Club. Um, to, uh, uh, they involve uh, uh, children to, um, uh, to their collection uh, and they research it together and uh, so they work uh, towards uh, 
um, um, how, uh, how to say to to bring uh, the young generation uh, to to their uh, collection. Okay, I, I hope uh, <laughs> I'm in time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I don't you, know Chilin. if you could see the presentation. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. We could see so, all the slides. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Thank, Thank you. you, all the presenters of the best practice session. Um, so, Marilyn, um, can we have just a two, three minutes for the questions? But I cannot see any questions in the chat. Is there any question, Anna? There was just one question for Anna. Is the course for free? And if not, how much does it cost? Anna? Um, yeah. Uh, tours are free if we are organizing it for the general public, uh, but if uh, schools want to come, then we uh, we're uh, charging a small fee um, just for a guide to because we are doing it for voluntarily. We all have to work <laughs> in other jobs, but yeah, it's, we just charge the same amount as a for a cheeseburger. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Also, Any another question for Sharin. What are your main challenges the upcoming period? Um, Sher please, I'm Sharon, you are muted, I think. Um, as you know, uh, we are now just recovering from pandemic time. So we are working to, again with our audience to bring them again to museums. So we started to organize uh, our lectures, uh, our um, different kinds of master classes. As I said, we make performances uh, and uh, the new performances. So uh, our main goal is uh, to work with the local community, with the different uh, uh, age people, with children and uh, uh, with students. Uh, we uh, also again started our um, uh, volunteer program. So this is our uh, um, uh, first uh, uh, challenges, uh, the main challenges. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now we have just a really short presentation of one of the research which is made just entirely for uh, by our project beneficiaries. I will ask these three girls, Mariam, Elina and Anna. Hello, good evening from Tbilisi. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I'm Elina Valaitet, a member of the museum team, and uh, we're so honored to be present today with the final presentation of our research that we did last year. Uh, I will start quickly. Yeah, I hope you see my screen. Uh, first of all, we would like to uh, thank our colleagues and the local communities who have been the part of our research and made the process possible. Uh, as you see on the screen, uh, we would like to present our team who have been involved in this uh, project uh, titled uh, Museum Communication in Georgia. Uh, Lana Karaya, me, myself, Elina Olaide, Mariam Chaide, and Anna Ziklauri. Uh, during last year, starting from July 2021 until 2022 um, January, uh, we worked uh, in, different, in 11 different uh, regions and cities uh, of Georgia, uh, plus we have been interviewing local communities. Uh, out of 330 museums, we interviewed 226 museums directly. Um, 11 different regions have been uh, choose um, not by accident, but we really uh, choose like very popular, let's say, touristic places and also very rural, rural places and some uh, even cities and villages and museums that uh, are like completely unknown and or like uh, just uh, forgotten by um, people. Uh, the research method that we used, uh, you see on the screen, it's a qualitative uh, method, interviews with the museum representatives, uh, quantitative method, online questionnaires for museum representatives, questionnaires for locals, interpersonal communication, observation of museum visitors. The lesson learned that uh, was found out during the research, because as we all know that uh, last year was like really um, hard uh, in terms of COVID-19 uh, uh, 
pandemic. So due to the high numbers of cases, questionnaires for locals have been distributed digitally via social media channels during the field visit of specific places using the snowball method of research, meaning that we have been asking the local communities to spread the word about the questionnaires and make it possible to fill it out. Um, uh, related to the observation and locations, I would like to ask Mariam uh, to continue. Mariam, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alina. Uh, for the quantitative part of the research, our aim was to interview 50% per location and observe the general situation in museums. It was very interesting uh, to communicate with the various types of people living in the country. Hearing that the questions were about the museums, most of them are the typical tasks. Uh, some of the interviews they were holding the distance at first, thinking that we were checking if they knew the information and about the museum and exhibits themselves. But after the few questions, they felt more relaxed and stated their opinion freely. The part of this work, as Alina said, was uh, the limited time at the remote areas for work and coordinating. We had to interview people during the peak of the pandemic in Georgia, and sometimes we even were not able to find a person outside uh, in the streets. So we decided to adapt to the situation and use the, the snowball method to achieve the goal. Uh, we have sent the online questionnaires to the people we knew that lived in those areas and asked them to fill them and send out only to the people living in the regions. For the observation part of the research, uh, we were interested for alternative methods of uh, communication in museums, such as signs and texts. Uh, for example, if there were enough signs for the visitor to move around uh, the museum without hindrance, uh, and for the lingual texts, as uh, the museums in uh, Georgia care for the local visitors, but have to be ready for international ones too. Uh, now I'm giving floor to Anna, who will tell more about the quantitative part of the research. Anna? Thank you, Mariam. Uh, our main goal within the quantitative part of the research was to contact all museums in Georgia and involve them in the process. Although our first challenge within the working process was the incomplete database of museum contacts, so the kind of indirect result of our work became confirming the status and completing the contact list of all the museums in Georgia. The outcome of the process was that we got in touch with all 330 active and working museums in Georgia covering every region, city and village. And after the long process of communication with museum representatives, during which we did our best to answer all the Earl's questions, we are proud to say today that 226 museums became part of our research. And I wanted to, to take time now to thank the museum representatives on behalf of our team for taking time being so involved and cooperative in the process. Uh, we chose to create online surveys as uh, they would be easiest to distribute across the country. Uh, it is important to note that because of Georgia's population's linguistic richness, uh, we decided to create bilingual surveys and adapt to the linguistic needs of various museums to reach the maximum level of inclusivity. Uh, we distributed the surveys via email and the desired responders were the communication department staff of museums, so it is crucial to underline the fact that in majority of museums, surveys were were answered by museum directors or managers and not communication managers, for instance. This can be explained by the fact that in most museums of Georgia, communication department is not developed enough, and these activities are carried out by different members of the staff. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the main topics uh, covered the questions uh, that you see on the screen. I'm not going to list them right now because we are short in time, uh, but I want to underline the surprising and kind of very important finding that uh, became clear was the definitive role of museum unions and cultural centers in communication process. It became clear from the answers that surveys in some cases were filled out by the representatives of various museum unions or cultural centers in which the specific museum belonged to. So we, of course, got interested in this specific case, got back to the responders with questions and uh, the answer and kind of reasoning that we got for this issue was that some museums in Georgia, specifically in rural areas, lack appropriate environment and resources to lead an effective communication. So various museum unions and cultural centers acted as kind of mediators in the process. Now I will pass the word to Elena. 
Um, thank you, Anna. Uh, as you see, like, um, and also I will be short, like, because we're running out of time. As you see, based on the analysis of the research data, the necessary recommendation and approach have been developed. And as a result of the entire research and analysis, a bilingual research publication will be published very soon. But before, we would like to underline some short hints that we found that were very interesting uh, as a result uh, coming out of the research. The perception related to the news on Georgia that comes from the local community is all about the education. Um, of course, we think that uh, it might be the rejector because the museum is not only the place for education, but also for pleasure, leisure, and having fun and having a rest. I think we need to, like the Georgia Museums, need to work in that direction to take some kind of uh, perception and bring some new uh, meaning to the uh, museums. Um, the communication format, the most effective format is the social media and digital ads. We found out that uh, for majority of Georgia Museums, social media, a particular Facebook page. It's uh, one of the main, uh, um, let's say, tools that they're communicating with uh, their communities, uh, even though some of them, they don't have um, the official web page, but they're using the Facebook page. The message content for the local communities that are most effective is call to action, meaning that uh, the local communities uh, feel engaged when the museums, for instance, communicating with them and inviting to the opening or any kind of events. And also the cognitive content, meaning that when museums are sharing the, uh, the content uh, about some historical uh, base or some any uh, important stories related to each of uh, the museum and uh, any kind of uh, object that they uh, held in, the, in their archives. The obstacles of direct communication uh, we have is like four main obstacles. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for majority of museums, it's lack of financial budget to make the effective communication, and even though just even thinking about the communication in general and how it should be developed. Uh, I know we're in 21st century, but uh, unfortunately, you know, there are some museums uh, where the lack of technology, meaning they don't have the smartphones and even computers and internet to uh, make and to create any kind of communications with their local communities. The internet inaccessibility, you know that Georgia is a mountainous region and in some of uh, mountainous places in Georgia, uh, we can't find the internet. And of course, it's also kind of obstacles to uh, create a proper communication with local uh, communities, the museums that are based in mountains. And of course, the lack of human resources because there are some museums uh, that uh, somehow have only two or four uh, uh, members and staff, and of course they need someone who will be in charge of communication. Uh, now I would like to ask Mariam to continue this part. Thank you, Amina. Uh, one of the interesting factors during uh, the research was that um, Atala Georgia is very uh, popular among tourists during the research. It was obvious that uh, for the majority of museums in Georgia, the main audience uh, were the local visitors. Uh, we also found out that uh, the communities from the remote areas uh, are visiting uh, local museums more than others in the country, opposed to the communities living close to the capital or in larger cities. The explanation for that could be the factor of more competitive situations in larger cities, where museums have to compete with various leisure and other establishments, while in the remote areas, museums serve as a place for commerce and intellectual source. And uh, one of uh, the obstacles of direct engagement with the local communities is that uh, the museums are not implementing internship or volunteering programs, while the majority of interviewed uh, communities express a goodwill and readiness to become a volunteer of their local museum. Erina will talk more about finding the emotions. Uh, yes, we um, and as a one of the main like um, hints and uh, findings out of this project, it was that like we create the wow effects uh, in uh, each interviewers, meaning that even when we've been talking with the museum representatives and like explaining why the and the, how the effective communication could be uh, like developing their um, organizations, they were saying like, oh wow, this is very interesting really can do that. And even with the local communities, when we were talking about the uh, cost benefits, that if they will become more engaged with the, the local museums, what they can really get from that. Um, of course, we are running off time, and I guess you can read on uh, screens um, what we have like as the main 
uh, findings and recommendations. Of course, the communication strategies should be developed and uh, the proper tactics should be used. Uh, also, awareness about the target audience. The majority of Georgian museums, they said that they, they know their uh, target audience, but it's not like that because mostly they think that they're really um, uh, doing uh, everything interesting, but they never did a proper target audience profiling that we really encourage them to do that. And uh, maybe I will go through by the end or Anna or Mariam, you can continue. Yeah, because as far as we're running out of time, storytelling, lack of understanding the, the, the importance of storytelling, the mainly like museum workers are thinking that storytelling is like guided to at the museums and uh, but it should be developed of course in a different way. The social media importance of the use of the correct channels and communication with the audience. Of course, not only Facebook should be used, but any other channels that uh, are really in use right now. And uh, Museum as a social agent, it's very interesting thing that we found out when I guess when the um, uh, the, the, the final paper will, will be ready, you will go through that and you will understand about what we're saying. Georgian museums are doing like really great things, but uh, intuitively, and they really don't understand that it's very important. By the end, uh, the toolkit also created within the research paper, because uh, our main goal is not to just give the recommendations, but also to help the museum workers to create the strategic communication plans and audience uh, audience profiling and by the end we would like really to thank everyone we would like to thank uh, all organizations the creative europe the georgian museums association the nemo the dutch academy of cultural management who made possible to uh, make this project in such a great way thank you was really important as it created a new platform for museum workers in the region. It was my first experience to participate in such a large-scale regional project, uh, meeting with professionals, practicing, discussing and sharing experience to our colleagues uh, gave us um, strength and confidence to create new programs and communicate with audiences. During the seven years of working together as chief communications managers at the Georgian National Museum, we found our passion in designing spaces and experiences that help others explore the world through art, science and the culture. Uh, precisely, and participating in the museum project helped us design and enhance effective communication with our customers and creating engaging digital content that was essential to the 21st century and was especially relevant during the pandemic. Views on my project brought a new page into my professional development and accordingly positively affected to my museum, is bringing up more ambitious steps in the daily life. The project's concept was oriented to turn ideas into actions, also to analyze difficulties and come up with solutions. If you can perform using this, Two key drivers, your ambition to make a positive impact in museums' work seems not to be that challenging. I got involved with the museum activities as a master's student of museology, so my whole experience and kind of history with the museum can be seen as a transformation path from a university student to an active museum worker. In this experience, the museum has definitely played an important role as it really sharpened my professional perspectives and showed me that museums are much more than what they seem at first glance and they are much more versatile and diverse organizations where they there is a plenty of room for new ideas and development. And I've been a part of the project called Bee Museum. That was a project that gave me professional knowledge, new skills and experiences. And the trainings were related to different issues. All of them were supporting, uh, supportive and helpful for my museum. Uh, Bee Museum has uh, hugely impacted my professional uh, point of view. Uh, with this project, I have gained more confidence uh, as a professional and uh, I see the museum now as a complex uh, organization and uh, the point of, uh, my point of view has changed. Uh, now I work in a new museum which relates to my point of view better than the older one. Project B Museum is a very important step to my career. It was very helpful to improve confidence success and institutional structure for my museum.
The project helped us to specialize the learning to our organizations and the learning led me to plan more uh, inclusive and flexible program, educational programs. Learning from the program helped me adapt to my organization in many different ways, such as uh, running the projects, evaluating uh, with more precise details, such as uh, co-creation, cooperation and orientation on sustainability. The museum provided out with best practices and um, insight into the museum sector from several cultural perspectives, their requirements, their markets. The work is to understand what fits your institution best and use the skills to erase borders and make the space more accessible. While participating in the museum, we had a chance to work intensively with local and international experts on museum communication, PR and marketing. So fostering building strong partnerships and fostering professional connections were one of the benefits of the project. And also noticing the model of the project that we had a chance to exchange our gained experiences between uh, our local colleagues from different museums and then also working together in groups with our colleagues from neighboring countries, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Yes, and we participated in the workshops and conferences, we had practical activities and we get aware of the global consciousness in the field of arts, heritage management and culture. Museum activities has had an important impact on my career path and my interests. For example, a lot of uh, museum trainings really opened up a new themes for discussion for me regarding museum communication, digital initiatives in museums, and I had an impact on my master's thesis and in the future helped me to find various jobs and internships in this sphere. Learning process was really productive. I'm still keeping to adapt learning from the program to my everyday life. In my museum, I have uh, not uh, yet uh, implemented all the learnings I have gained during the project, but uh, everything is uh, up to come. Uh, I guess that uh, my museum will respond to the challenges of the 21st century museum life, uh, and its goal will be uh, widened uh, more than other museums. Through the program, I uh, realized that the most important thing we needed to change was marketing. Uh, if we want to promote our collections and uh, our service, we need to communicate more to our uh, audience. Many small details became important and turned into more professional ways of doing it. One of the exciting topics for me was the practice of in-country network between museums to be more accessible to public, also study management skills responding to current museum challenges. And during the three years, while working together with museum professionals, we get knowledge about European expertise and European know-how that we try to afterwards apply these innovative tools to the work we did at the Georgian National Museum. The museum that gave me much more than uh, some narrow, maybe, professional skills. It also showed me how to use them in a real-life work environment and also how to implement the leadership skills and lead and work with small or large multilingual or multicultural groups. That is a skill that is very important nowadays. Impact of project on my work is obvious. My perception about museum and museum activities absolutely changed. Now I know that old museums could be a very modern places. Uh, the project of the Museum uh, gave me confidence and uh, gave me uh, skills as a leader to uh, speak out with my colleagues and with the staff members to uh, underline uh, my opinions and discuss them uh, uh, how the organization should work and what is better for the museum. I gained new skills, uh, I developed uh, the ability to manage unexpected situations and that really helped me through this pandemic. With the BIM Zomer project, I have improved self-motivation, team skills and success orientation. 
Over the course of three years, I have joined the EP Museum for several training on different topics. Each time I discovered experiences that bear values of inclusion, diversity and creativity in the museum sector. Now I look back and see that it all was an incredible journey and earned me the opportunity to develop skills that assist me in the project that I take on. I would say that because of Bureau's over activities such as trainings and workshops, many before unspoken and undiscussed themes became a top priority for museums of Georgia. For example, museum marketing, museum communication, digital initiatives and um, public educational programs. My working skills improved. I am more peace and quiet. I'm always smiling and listening to my visitors, even if they made me really crazy. Uh, being a museum means to me uh, like communication, development, new mindset, and new possibilities. To be a museum for me means a person who is dedicated and eager for changes. To be a museum means to me be in the service of society, to contribute to my team, to meet goals and manage projects that will make us more inclusive, diverse, and close to the audience. To be a museumer means to be a part of an active, innovative and versatile process that can make a real life changes in a museum sphere in our country. For me to be a museumer means to be uh, caring, caring for the heritage and caring for the society and to be curious, uh, curious uh, again for the um, heritage, for the uh, exhibits kept in the museum and curious uh, for the society. Uh, what um, drives the society, what are the problems in society, as the museum should uh, always work uh, with and for the society. Being a museum means to have a very big and supportive family or an all around the museums. Project Being Museumer means to me to be a part of a big international family who keeps protects and maintains cultural heritage, develops museum workers' professional skills and abilities. And being a museum it's, um, it's really exciting and inspiring at the same time. And it's kind of a privilege as well, right?